Everyone, welcome back to the Emotional Man podcast. Today, I am thrilled to have with me my cousin-in-law. Is that I guess is that so? A yeah. Term? Nathan Webb, and he is the founder of Blaze Be Gone, which is a company that helps remove bullying from schools. And I'll let him maybe correct the best way to say that. Also, he has three kids, ages five to four months, which I should say a belated congratulations. On thank you, that. thank you, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we like him. He sleeps a lot. So, Nate, why don't we go ahead and start off? Why don't you share a little bit about Bullies Be Gone, where the idea came from, and how you started it? Yeah, totally. Bullies Be Gone started back in 2018. So uh, I did pest control. I sell pest control, still do. Long time. This upcoming summer is going to be my like eighth summer doing it. And in 2018, I was starting my third summer. I was in Alabama and I was knocking door to door. And I just had the feeling like, I want to do more. I want to be more. I want to be more fulfilled. As a door to door salesman, you can make a shiz ton of money, but it is not very fulfilling. It is low key the sucks. It is very much a means to the end or people who just really love money and don't really care the past to get it. They do it forever and ever. That's not me. And so when I was doing, I was like, I want to be more, what can I do so I can be more fulfilled? And, but at the same time, maybe provide for my family. And I thought about starting this YouTube channel called bullies be gone. Cause I got bullied a lot as a kid and I learned some tough life lessons. Several of them, I wish I could have learned sooner. And so I started thinking about my stories and the different things that could resonate. And at the time I just barely graduated with my bachelor's in psychology with a little emphasis on behavior analysis. And I had applied and been rejected from the school psychology program at Utah State. And I'm like, crap, I got this degree in psychology. It's useless. What grad program can I do? And so I had been accepted into a grad program for school counseling. And going into that had reminded me about my passion for helping kids get through bullying. And anyway, while I'm knocking doors this summer, that, that summer, 2018, I thought about, I came up with the idea for Bullies Be Gone. And initially, it was just going to be a YouTube channel educating people about bullying and had tips and tricks on how to get over bullies and a mindset thing, not really talking much about bullies, but more empowering bully victims. In the end, I figured out I didn't like YouTube very much, at least creating on YouTube. And I was a lot better at creating on Instagram. And so it turned into an Instagram page. And then that next fall... I gave my first presentation. I was in my one of my wife's seventh grade classrooms. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was so much fun. I love this. Because at the time I'd been thinking, okay, what do I need to do to monetize being an influencer on Instagram about this subject? And then I spoke and I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I really want to do. I want to speak. And so it was tricky because that is when I entered into my grad program was 2018 was when I started the fall of 2018. It's a three-year program, including an internship. And so I got my first paid speaking gig in 2019. The next year, my wife's aunt is a PTA president over in Kaysville area. And I gave my first presentation, paid presentation. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just got paid to do this. (laughs) And so that's where it started. And then from there, I've been able to partner with an amazing organization called Save the Kids. They help get gigs for me and and speak more and podcasting. And it's a lot of stuff has come from that, but that's where it started. That's amazing. Having been, I I swear everyone's been bullied at least once. Oh yes. Everyone's experienced unkindness. Maybe they haven't been bullied, but they faced unkindness that really felt like it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's still even a lot of bullying that happens at work. It just, it's not consigned to the school environment. No, definitely not. So when we talk about when you, You know, you're a school counselor, you're starting about doing the speaking gig. Where are you at now? Because I believe you've made an important decision. I have. So this last school year, between Save the Kids and my own efforts, I had gone out and I'd given quite a lot of presentations. And some people are like, how do you do that and work full time? I'm like, I use my time off. (laughs) I take my personal leave. I take my sick leave and I use that and I go speak with it. And I, I almost ran out this year, which was scary because then my wife had a baby in January. I'm like, crap, I need to use this. And because I pretty much ran out, I was like, you know what? Something needs to give. I either need to do this less or jump all in. And me and my wife were religious. And so we prayed about it and we went and 
we went and talked about it with God and we felt like this is what we were supposed to do. So we decided to jump all in. So actually today is this, well, this is the last day that this is my background ever. Um, <laughs> this is my last day in my office actually. And then I'll be doing Bullies Be Gone, Save the Kids full time. Wow. So my next question was going to be, how did you go about making that decision? Now, you said you're a religious person, that you went and prayed, asked God about it. Can you share a little bit more about how you approached that conversation with your wife? Yeah. And so it had that. been something that had been on the discussion table, per se, for a while. That was the end game has always been, oh, man, I really want to do this full time. I really want to be able to do this full time. And so what tangible things, goals can we set that would give us a good gauge as to when we think we're ready to do this full time? And we're like, money was important. So let's set some financial goals with this and see if we can hit them. And so the last quarter of 2022, I was able to completely match my income as a counselor with speaking gigs. And so I was like, okay, I was able over that three month period, I was able to match that. And that's, that was full-time counselor, full-time wrestling coach, full-time everything else as well. And just imagine if I open up my time to be able to do the business full-time, to reach out to schools full-time and do everything else instead of sending an email with my 15 minutes I have in between kids and not making a single phone call and making an Instagram post at the end of the day and that kind of stuff. Imagine what I can do with that much more time. And so once we hit some of those financial goals, we're like, okay, I think we can do this. And, but are we sure? And so we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so we went out to the nearest temple and we went and we prayed and talked to God about it. And it was very interesting. I had the thought of, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, I can't drive a parked car. Don't be afraid. And my wife had the impression of trust your husband. When she told me that, I was like, ha, huh, scary. I don't like that as, as much because I, the imposter syndrome, but you're like, oh, well, trust me. I don't know about that. You, can you just said it's going to be okay. <laughs> but combined with those two things, we're like, okay, let's give this a shot. We're going to regret it forever if we don't. And so that's how that decision was made. Now you mentioned that, that scare, that fear. One of our recent guests, his name was Ron. Swanson, sorry. <laughs> Not Ron Swanson. <laughs> He's the owner of Nut Nest. And he talked about how the weight is worth it. The emotional weight, you know, that mental, physical weight is worth it. Can you share, how do you manage the stress, the worry, the fear that comes with taking this leap of faith? Day by day. And being open and honest with my communications with my wife, especially a lot of times it's really easy to just bottle everything up. And especially with my job, I'm forced to as a school counselor, compartmentalize things. And there's some things I can't talk about with my wife, some heavy things. I can't name names if some kid today was telling me he's planning on killing himself and depression and self-harm and having to call parents and to have a police officer take a kid to the hospital, some heavy stuff that I can't really talk about. And that takes a toll. And so this is actually a little liberating because I can actually talk about all of my fears and concerns now in open and honest conversation with my wife. And if she's having a tough time, she lets me know, hey, I need not heaviness today. <laughs> can we have not heaviness today? I'm like, absolutely. Let's go watch Modern Family and laugh our heads off. But having that open, honest conversation is how I've been trying to manage the weight of it all. And then not forgetting to do things that I enjoy and love. So oftentimes, especially as, as entrepreneurs, business owners, our hobby becomes our business. And then all of a sudden we have no hobbies and we have no fun. <laughs> but we feel, especially in this day and age, that entrepreneurship is cool. We feel a lot of pressure to monetize every single hobby and have document all the fun and turn it. But then that takes the magic out of all your hobbies. And so I try to engage in stuff that I still enjoy, like playing Power Ranger video games on my Switch from time to time when the kids go down and the wife's in the shower, doing stuff that I enjoy, and then talking to my wife when I'm feeling heavy. Yeah. The, the burden or just the balancing of hobbies, of work, of family can really get to you. How do you manage the emotions? Because that's something we haven't really talked about on this podcast. 
We've talked a lot about having open, honest communication with your family, mm -hmm. setting priorities, setting boundaries, but there is just a lot of emotional energy that kind of courses through us during the day. And especially you as a, as a counselor, dealing with suicide, dealing oh, with yeah. everything that comes along with that. How do you manage the emotions so that a, you're not numbing yourself to it and just numbing yourself to experience in general or hiding away from it. So you just constantly escaping from reality. Yeah, that's a good question. I think what has helped me is a, a conscious effort to not manage my emotions, to feel my emotions. When something comes up, you feel it. You're pissed, be angry. You're sad, cry. You're happy, laugh. Feel your emotions don't try and check them. I feel like a lot of times when we talk about manage our emotions, we try and check them. We try and you know, calm your senses, young Padawan. Calm the crap down. When really it's it, just fill them. Like you're feeling a lot of sadness. It's okay to cry. Did you just lose your entire crap on your four-year-old because you were annoyed and you'd had a long day and you snapped at them? Yeah, you did. Say sorry. Okay. You felt some emotions and you made a mistake. I don't feel like the key is not trying to manage them, but just feeling them. The negative outcomes, the snapping at your loved ones, that comes when you try too much to bottle them up and too much to manage them. If you'd feel them right when the things happen, you'd feel it, it happened. Wow, that lasted a few minutes instead of bottling up and ruining my entire week. And so feel them, don't manage them. How would you describe that as a technique other than just feel them? Like, what does it look like to feel your emotions? Especially that's, you know, you're a business owner, you're working with employees, something goes wrong. You think, oh, that shouldn't happen. You start feeling frustrated and you start feeling angry. Boom. So, so exactly. You start feeling these things. It helps to narrate whether it's, especially if the anger or if that feeling is directed towards something or someone being able to verbally say that out loud, something happened, like someone screwed up and you lost money or someone screwed up and you have to put out a fire. You can be open and honest, but man, this is really frustrating. I really wish this wouldn't have happened. This is something that has totally thrown me off today. And this is really frustrating if I'm being totally honest. Being honest with our emotions is a good way to acknowledge that we're feeling those emotions instead of, ah, I'm mad, but I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm frustrated, but I don't want to make them feel like I don't value them. Words, say the thoughts that are coming in so they can validate the feelings that are being felt. And what does that do for you? It helps me get over them quicker instead of just, oh, pondering forever and ever in silence. And then sometimes they're just amplifying in silence, saying them, getting them out into the open, making them real so that they can be real. And then you can move forward. It, help, yeah, it helps me process them a little bit faster when I say them out loud. There's a part of our culture, especially for business owners, especially for men, to be stoic. <laughs> Suck it up. Yeah, to only be willing to express certain emotions, not to express anything that makes you appear weak or unstable or to, hey, leave, leave the emotional crap at home, leave the emotional crap at work. How do you respond to that? I respond to that by saying, no, thank you. <laughs> oh, it get, it get, and this is a really trigger happy um, topic, especially in the psychology realm, toxic masculinity, right? We're not demon, those people who talk about toxic masculinity, it's like we're not demonizing masculinity. We're demonizing the toxic traits that people have thrust onto what they think it means to be masculine, right? Where it is toxic to bottle up your feelings, to leave the emotional crap and to never acknowledge, to never cry, blah, blah, blah. It takes strength to cry. It is hard for me to allow my emotions in front of other people besides my wife. But when I do, I feel so much better when I do that. When I allow myself to feel my emotions, regardless of my audience, regardless of, of where I am, whatever it might be. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to consciously try to ugly cry and get attention and my guy liner running down my face. But if I need to cry, I'll cry. If I'm angry, I'll let, you know, I'm not going to hide things. When people... I don't know, when people, when the pressures of men to, to not have emotions, that's why I've, that's a big reason why I, in my opinion, at least 
why men's suicide rates are a little bit higher, why men's mental health issues are a little bit longer lasting than our female counterparts, because we have that pressure to not have emotions. And yet we want our kids to be emotionally healthy, but we're not allowing ourselves to have those emotions. It's backwards in my opinion. So to those people who say those things, I say, no, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> now, let's talk about one of the things you talked about was your wife saying, let's not have a heavy day. Setting boundaries. Yeah. So th there's two things here. I want to talk about setting boundaries and clear communication, but I also want to talk about two transitions I have found with business owners that are really difficult. The transition of the chaos that can come with the morning with all the kids to work, yeah. and yeah. then all the burden stressors that have built up during work to the transition at home when the kids are tired or the wife really needs you to step in if she's a stay-at-home mom. But we've seen these two transition periods be the most difficult. Can you share some experiences or stories of when those transition periods have been hard for you and yeah. what you've learned about them? So when I make my posts to Instagram, I'm really active on Instagram. And when I make those posts, it's typically right after school. And I'm always super stressed about it because I want to get back home. I want to help my wife and this and that. And in the past, before we had children, even when our first child was born, I'd have an issue being on my phone quite a lot trying to engage my Instagram audience and different things. And that, that transition right after work where I'm trying to get that Instagram post in and I come in, there was a couple times where I'm like, oh, I just want to be home already. So I came home, I went inside and I got on my Instagram to get things done. And Kim was like, I really don't like that. If you're going to be home, I want you to be home. I don't care if you take 10 extra, 15, 20 extra minutes to make that Instagram post, to do whatever you need to do so that you can just be home. And so when I started to integrate that into my life, not only for the posting of Instagram, but if I had a hard day at work, taking a second to decompress in the car and getting myself ready to go in my house and be dad. There's an analogy that really stuck with me that I heard at scout camp once. It was about this, oh, this old welder or mechanic or something that his, he had an apprentice follow him for the day. And and when he, at the end of the day, he was getting out of his truck and he stopped by a tree and he was just making a motion looking like he was hanging invisible things on the tree before he went to go inside. And his apprentice is like, what on earth are you doing? You are a crazy old man. And he's, I'm putting all my problems, hanging them on the tree before I go inside so that I leave them outside of my house. And I'm not saying you got to do that, guys, but. It has helped me to take an extra 15, 20 minutes, take a beat in between work and home to become, I am at home now, <laughs> to tra <laughs> Autobots transform, to transform <laughs> into dad. I am no, I'm not business, Nate. I'm dad. And take a second so that you can hang your problems, put them on hold, check them at the door, whatever you need to do, make note of them so you can come back to them later when you have time for them. But right here, right now, you need to be dad. And so that's helped me with that transition. Now, the other transition, the craziness of the kid, like the, the before the family and before you head into work, I'm more excited for that one because I haven't had to deal with that one yet. That's something that's been a stressor for me is not being able to help in the mornings. As an educator, my contract time is 7.30 to 3 p.m., 7.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. My kids thankfully sleep from eight to seven 30. Yeah. So like 8 PM, seven 30, that's quiet time. And rarely do they arise before seven 15. I'm usually gone by seven 15. Half the time I have a podcast recording at 7 AM. And so that's been a kind of a stressor for me is, Oh man, like I don't get to help Kim out in the mornings, especially she is, she has so many talents. Being a morning person is not one of them. And so like it's, I am a morning person. I'm an early bird. So I'm excited actually to, to have a more like a nine to five instead of a seven 30 to three or choose my hours. So like when I'm home, I can help out in the mornings and get the kids to school and get them ready. And then like by nine o'clock, it's like easy to slip away and be like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do a thing for two hours. Are you okay? She's like, oh yeah, we're fine. So I'm excited for that part. That part is something that I am more happy to help out with. Cause I haven't been able to help out with it for the last four years. Talking about helping around the house. <laughs> One, yeah, yeah. We're going to get it. We're going to go. It's a trap. No. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about 
roles in the family. As you juggle the responsibilities of going to work, how do you engage in responsibilities at the home? And have they changed since when you were first initially married? So we are not super organized in the aspect of, all right, it is thine job to wash my laundry, and it is my job to make the money. But around the house, basically, is we adopted the philosophy. We didn't like intentionally say, this is our philosophy, but we more realized, oh, wow, we do this. See a need, fill a need. Like we try and stay top of the day-to-day -day stuff Kim does while she's at home. But as you got a couple kids, you got to keep those suckers alive. That's the bottom line. <laughs> and so like I'll come home and the dishes aren't done. So after, after dinner, while the kids are playing around and Kim's doing whatever, I'll do the dishes. Kim actually, guys, hear this. She takes out the trash sometimes, okay? Can your wife do that, y'all? Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. But seriously, we just see a need, fill a need. She has her projects she's working on during the day. And if I notice something that needs to get done, and I notice something, some blaring thing, like we've completely run out of laundry. I should probably do the laundry. Then I'll do the laundry. I'll fold the laundry. I'll put it away. I'll see a need, fill a need. Whatever you got time for, do it. And then if some Kim needs me to do something specifically and she doesn't want me to do something because she knows my go-tos, I do a lot of the dishes, I do a lot of laundry, and I do a lot of yard work. And so if she needs something else done that she knows will take time, and if I do one of my one of my power three that I won't be able to get to what she needs, then she'll let me know, hey, instead of this thing you usually do, could you please do this instead because I'm working on this? Oh, sure. Yeah, sweet. So we just, I guess we just talk about it. And then if not, if we see a need, fill a need. I love that. See a need filling. It even it just rolls off the tongue really well too. Yep, yep. Credit to Kim on that one. She kind of she's the one that said that. <laughs> now I want to kind of pivot for the last ten minutes or so of this conversation to defining success for the family. There's a lot of chatter out there around what the family should look like. Our family's broken. Our family's failing. How would you go about defining success for your family and why is that success? Success in the family. There's a couple things that I want to, that I immediately think of. Number one, do your kids know that they are loved, that they are strong, that they're loved and that they will always be enough. Do your kids know that and do your actions reflect that for me? it's funny sometimes people we talk about success in terms of monetary gains and while it's cool to have successful monetary things within a business and have goals like that if your definition of success is based off of monetary things it'll never be enough because you can always have more money and so if success for me especially in the family is a if my kids know that they love that i love them and b if my spouse if my wife feels that same way and if my actions reflect that, you know, if, if my kids are always like, daddy, like you, like, for example, actually one day my, my son came upstairs with a little Altoid can. I was like, this is my phone. I was like, oh crap. <laughs> Dang it. Dad needs to do some repenting here. And so we set some boundaries for smartphones for me and Kim so that our kids could see that we want to set boundaries with our technology. And it was after a really tough week of having a newborn and both of us were just like, we need to numb our brains. Y'all need to watch Puppy Dog Pals. We need to decompress. <laughs> and afterwards, they're like, look, Daddy, I have a phone now, too. And I was like, oh, no, uh, uh And so I had to do some repenting there. But yeah, making sure that our kids know that we love them and our spouses do, too. I feel like love is the best way to gauge success for me. And if someone is feeling and knowing how much I love and appreciate them, then I feel pretty successful. How do you determine if you are being successful? Like, how do you know if your kids know that they love, like that they feel loved? Example, when my wife goes to pick up my son from preschool is the cutest thing because he will just arms out like an airplane and just run towards her mom. And then when I come home, same thing, dad grabs my leg and stuff like that. When my kids want to goof around and roughhouse with me after a long day at work, that's how I know that I'm being successful as a dad <laughs> because they want to be with me. The moment that my actions start to influence my kids in a way that make them not to want to spend time with me, that's when I'm not being as successful. <laughs> that's when I need to maybe change some things so that I can be more successful in ways that they want to be with me.
because of the things I say and the things I do. I love that. Do your kids want to be around you? <laughs> yep. Barring yep. aside teenagers who are just they're, they're yeah. just well, identifying. Oh, wait, yeah. As humans develop, we become more primitive when we get into our teenage caveman grunt years. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Do your kids want to be with you? And with teenagers, that's why I said by the things you do and say. Teenagers, they want to spend less time with you because they have friends. They have lives now. It's not because of anything you've done. When it's because of something you've done or said, that's when we might need to change something. Okay. One final question. Now, you're early in your business career, but yeah. how long have you been married? I've been married seven years. Seven years. Okay. If you could distill some drops of wisdom that you could give young Nate, newly married Nate, seven years ago, about being a father, about being a husband, about being this new business owner, what would you tell them if you could go back? Oh, don't stress as much. Things will always work out. Put your phone down a little bit more and give hugs and kisses a lot more. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, well, everyone, this has been Nate Webb, founder of Bullies Be Gone, three kids, five to four months old. We're so grateful to have you here. Now, Nate, if there's anyone out there listening who thinks, you know what? My school could really use a presentation about bullying, how to handle being bullied, maybe a message to bullies. What's the best way they could get in contact with you? You can always email me, bullies.speaker at gmail.com. Instagram, I always pay attention to my DMs and I always message back at bulliesbegone, bulliesbe.gone, bulliesbe.gone. And then I have a speaker form that I can send you to if you want. They can click on that and they can fill that out. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can visit those things, email, Instagram, whatever it might be. I always respond. Okay, great. We will drop that speaker form in the show notes for everyone. Again, everyone, this has been Nate Webb. Thank you so much for your time and the laughs and the wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.